Good morning. My name is Daniel Shelton. I am the bereavement coordinator with Southwest Medical Hospice and Palliative Care. And on behalf of, uh, on behalf of them, I would like to welcome all of you to this semi-annual celebration of life. It is an opportunity for both the loved ones of, our, of those who have died under our care, as well as the staff, our staff, to reflect, on, reflect, honor, and pay tribute to those who have died under our care, as well as died under our care. It is also time to acknowledge our grief and the challenges we face uh, during the bereavement process. We are so grateful you have taken time to attend this celebration of life. I would like to begin with a quote by Heather Wynn, a family and consumer sciences educator. She wrote, people do not get over the death of a loved one. It is more descriptive to say people adjust to life without their loved one. Getting over it implies the relationship is over, but with death, the relationship does not really end, it just changes. So how long does it take to adjust to life after the death of a loved one? This is like asking how high is up. It depends on many factors. And the answer is, it takes as long as it takes. Some people mourn for months and some for years. The pain of losing someone close is different for each individual because no two relationships are alike. Though your losses were an event that occurred in an instant, Bereavement is a process, and depending on countless factors, it can, take, it can be a lengthy one at that. So that is why, as a bereavement counselor, I am pleased to see you here today, trying to come to terms with your losses. And we hope that today's memorial service will be another small step on the long road to recovery. Today's remarks will go as follows. The invocation will be provided by Robert Fleming, one of our chaplains. After him, we'll hear from Mike, Michael McKitch, the Vice President for uh, Hospice and Palliative Care. And then Carol DeGrazia, the Executive Director, will offer her remarks. Followed by Dr. Lisa, Lisa Ro Rosenberg, our Hospice Medical Director. And then myself, Robert. As Daniel has already said, thank you for coming. I want to recognize the fact that you are here and to simply say thank you and to recognize that this may not have been an easy moment to arrive to. You may have sat in the parking lot. You may have driven around the building a couple of times wondering whether or not you really wanted to come here today. And so as staff, we say thank you. I want to say as a chaplain, sometimes I'm invited in and sometimes I'm not. But the mere fact that you allow us as families to come into your home, into a very personal space, into a sacred place, we hold that with honor. And we take that very seriously and we value that and so we thank you as a family for allowing us to care for your loved ones. As Daniel has already said, grief can take on many forms and it can last longer, shorter and I would say that whatever that process is, even in my own experience, it may get easier, but you never get over it. And the reason for that is, is that grief does not exist without love having been there first. So this morning, as I offer up a poem that I've kind of modified, but I offer it as our prayer this morning. We come together from the diversity of our grieving to gather in the warmth of this community. We give witness to our sadness. And we hope and pray that that sadness will also, there will be laughter. 
In times of darkness, we pray and we hope that we will also see light. As we continue to grieve those that have gone on, may we reflect, may we remember, and in some cases, may we even reevaluate our own lives and hold fast to the conviction that what we do in our lives matter. And may we do so as we carry on the legacy of those who we loved and who loved us. Amen. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Mikich. I'm the administrator for the hospice agency. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking Daniel and Carol and the rest of the hospice staff that uh, uh, produce this event. Um, in, a, in a few moments, you're gonna, we're going to read the names of uh, your loved ones and our patients that have been on service that have passed. Uh, it's a moving experience, um, but one that I'm proud to be part of. Uh, but I want to thank you for uh, putting on this event. It's very special. It's, you, don't, you do a very, very good job. Um, thank you for coming today. You're going to hear a lot of thank yous for allowing us to uh, provide care to your loved ones, and then also today participating in this event. Uh, as I was preparing today, uh, my comments for uh, for this, and you know what what I should share with you, I was thinking about uh, something different uh, besides the thank yous and the recognition uh, of the of of your loved ones and our patients. Um, you know, you may have thoughts about. You know, did we do the right thing? Did, did my loved one, mother, father, brother, sister, have you do the right thing? Did you know not only just with hospice care, but uh, with Southwest Medical Hospice? Uh, it may go through your mind. Uh, it it probably would mine it if I was in your same same position. So my thoughts today were are maybe a little bit different because it's timely with uh, something that just occurred yesterday. Um, the hospice agency, as you hopefully experience, takes the care that we provide very, very seriously. Um, as Robert indicated, you know, the, your space and your personal environment uh, to have people come in and, and do the things they do may be awkward at times. Uh, certainly, given the situation that, that unfolds, it's a very difficult thing. Um, but as I was preparing today for, for my words and what I was going to share, uh, coincidentally, we just completed uh, a survey by Medicare of our agency yesterday. And what Medicare does is they come in unannounced and they poke and prod into every aspect of care. And uh, it's something that we take very seriously because Medicare takes it very seriously because Medicare takes the care, you know, places the care that that we provide for your loved ones um, at such high standards that no compromise is allowed. So as you think about what happened in your choice with Southwest Medical Hospice, um, I'm offering maybe a bit of reassurance. Uh, we did very well with that survey. In fact, Medicare found no deficiencies in our patient care, which is a very rare occurrence. So on behalf of uh, United Health Group, uh, Southwest Medical Associates, uh, and myself, uh, we thank you for your care, but what, one of the things that we can offer back is we believe you chose right. We believe you chose the best. Um, so in closing, I'd like to thank you again for attending. I'd also like to thank the, the awesome and wonderful staff that uh, provides care every day. The, the difficulties that you went through uh, in the process that you dealt with, with the passing of your loved one, they deal with every day of the year, year in and year out. It's a strength, it's a passion that uh, just amazes me, continues to amaze me. I've been involved in this organization for five years. Uh, we have some of the best caregivers, professionals in medical care that, that exist out there anywhere. So it's my pleasure to Welcome you here today and to uh, introduce Carol DeGrazia, our executive director. Thank you.
Thanks, Mike. Those were nice words. As Mike said, I'm Carol DeGrazia, the Executive Director of the Hospice and Palliative Care Program. I am, as well, I'm honored to be here with you today. On behalf of the whole hospice team, the nursing assistants, nurses, social workers, chaplains, volunteers, clinical managers, providers, and administrative staff, it's been a pleasure to be invited into the homes of the 365 loved ones represented here at this celebration of life. I continue to be humbled that you have allowed us to be a part of your lives and share your journey when faced with the most difficult time of caring for and losing a loved one. I remember clearly the first celebration of life that I attended for a loved one. During that celebration ceremony, about six months after her passing, my loved one's name was written on the side of a paper dove and hung on a lighted Christmas tree. And, <clears throat> and through ceremony, we each took our dove off the tree and held it to our heart. I still have that dove somewhere in my belongings. Through the years, this anniversary has changed. In the beginning, it was the most important day in my life, a date that held tremendous importance. Now, years later, the date is in my heart and not an open wound on my sleeve. That service that I attended was a ritual of sorts. I was participating in communion with others that were going through their own journey of loss while living life in the clutches of grief. There is a strong sense of community that is experienced with these types of rituals, and I'm struck by the comfort received through readings, prayers, and other customs that give us permission to grieve, heal our hearts, and maintain a sense of hope during our sorrow. As I gaze at everyone gathered here, I'm reminded that although we often feel isolated as caregivers and grievers, we are not alone. <clears throat> Hospice memorial services and other similar events provide time for prayer, reflection, and celebration of those that have gone before us. Hospice celebration services are just one example of ritual that may help to honor our loved ones. Other rituals could include lighting a candle and keeping it by a special picture, sharing pictures with friends and family, creating collages and photo frames, inviting friends and family to share memories, maybe meeting on a special day such as birthdays and anniversaries creating a special pillow, quilt, or teddy bear, or wearing a piece of jewelry as a reminder of the person that you miss so dearly. Today, I'm wearing a charm that my sister wore every day, and it was given to me after her, not, after her death, and I, I have it right here. Sharing your memories through food and gathering. That could possibly be my favorite. <laughs> my family still often makes traditional food that my mother-in-law loved to cook. We can share those memories over the dishes that she taught us how to make. Writing in a personal journal or writing a letter to share your feelings and put them on paper. Reflect on prayer or musical selection or a poem that brings comfort to, and helps to heal. I'll share this relevant message, one that resonates with me, author unknown. To everything there is a season and a time to, and purpose to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. There are so many ways to carry out rituals that honor our loved ones and to bring them closer to our hearts. Rituals don't have to be big and ceremonial. Sometimes smaller and more private moments can bring us peace and healing. I have learned that grief cannot be ignored, hidden, put on hold, forgotten, or rationalized. Grief is a process, and for me, that process represents fear. I believe my fear comes from the pain of losing my loved ones and a loss of control. Missing my loved one and not knowing how long the period will be where the pain is palpable and knowing that it isn't going to be over until it is over. 
My grief, my grief has presented in many different ways throughout my lifetime and usually depends on the circumstances around the loss. At times during grief, I've been able to move right to celebration, as I did when my mother passed at 100 years old. She had a life well lived, and so celebration was the key to honoring her as a wife and mother. Another time it was the death of my sister, and the grief wasn't so sparing, and I repeated the stages of grief over and over again. We often do cycle through the stages of grief. Denial, isolation, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Sometimes we can skip certain stages of grief, as I did in the case of my mother. None of us here today is alone. And although we grieve for different people, our grief is shared. And so what brings us here today is not grief, but love. Love for the person that has died. Love that carries on in spite of their absence. This is a love that will carry on in our hearts until we meet with our loved ones on the other side. May peace be with all of you. Good morning, and thank you for coming today to have this experience with us. My name is Lisa Rosenberg. I'm the medical director of Southwest Medical Hospice and Palliative Care. I have the great privilege of working with some of the kindest, most sensitive, dedicated individuals you can find in healthcare or anywhere else. I also have the privilege of going to work every day to do something about which I am passionate and which selfishly brings me great fulfillment. I serve in one of the Jewish communities, Hevra Kedusha, literally translated means holy group. These groups help prepare Jewish individuals for burial in a ritual way. During the ritual preparation, we say the following to the individual still in the room with us. We ask your forgiveness for anything we do that is clumsy or imperfect. May you be blessed to integrate and accept all of the learning that this life has filled, sorry, that has filled this lifetime and move forward in blessedness. We ask your forgiveness for any indignity we may have caused you. Our intentions were pure. We are honored for the privilege of performing this mitzvah. A mitzvah is a good deed or something that we're commanded to do. When the members of our team enter your lives and your homes, we are doing something similar. We are helping to prepare our patients and their families for what is ahead, no matter how difficult that is. Our goal is to comfort and educate so that what is ahead is less scary. During our time in your lives, I hope that we have comforted. I hope that we have prepared you as well as possible. I hope we have given information that is useful I hope we have listened carefully and attentively. I do hope that we've not been clumsy. I hope that we have been useful and that you are glad we were there to help you at these difficult times. Thank you for allowing us the privilege to be in your lives. Last year, uh, 2018, as a hospice, we oversaw the deaths of 696 people. I was personally able to make verbal contact with 505 of the loved ones of those 696 deaths. We sent out 3,111 pieces of mail, including cards, letters, and information sheets on various aspects of grief and grieving. With the help of our fantastic volunteer, George, an additional 2,458 routine follow-up calls were made. SMA Hospice sponsored 119 support groups with a total attendance of 418. And I was able to personally meet with, to make 137 visits with the loved ones of our patients. Now, I don't share this information with you to brag, but to help you understand that as a hospice, we take your journey through grief seriously and have gone and will continue to go to great lengths to assist you in your bereavement needs. If you look 
uh, to the right of your, pro inside of your program, if you look on the right side, you'll see information on when and where we hold our support groups. However, we realize that many uh, are not comfortable with that setting or uh, cannot attend, attend for whatever reason. That is why we also offer individual grief counseling to anyone who might benefit from such visits. Often there's a misunderstanding that after 13 months, you are no longer eligible for, a bereavement, for our bereavement program. That is not true. We will continue to, assi to assist you in your bereavement needs until you no longer deem them necessary. Next, I would like to share with you a poem that might surprise you. It is an older poem written by the British author uh, John, uh, John Godfrey Sachs, who was inspired by, the Indi by an Indian legend when he wrote The Blind Men and the Elephants. It was six men of Indostan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind. They each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall, against his broad and sturdy side at once began to bawl. God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second filling of the tusk cried, Ho, oh, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp. To me, tis mighty clear, this wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal, and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up, thus boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee. What most, what most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he, tis mighty clear the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said, E'en the blindest man, can see, blindest man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact who can. This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Indostan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. Now, I hope you see where I'm going with that poem, um, but I'm sure some of you might be thinking, why on earth did he share that poem? Well, I actually share this poem often with the bereaved, especially when there is disagreements among family members about what grief actually looks like. You see, in this analogy, the elephant is our grief. It is large, intimidating, and difficult to avoid. Grief is also very challenging to describe if you have never encountered a significant loss before, especially when trying to explain, uh, trying to explain grief to someone who has never had a serious loss of their own. So if the elephant is our grief, then each of us is one of those blind men. And we are desperate to put our, and we are desperate to put our grief into words to help others understand what it feels like to have your heart broken. Some describe the grief as like hitting a wall, or it is a stabbing pain, much like a spear, or it is like a snake that has wrapped its suffocating body around you, or like a tree that cannot be climbed, or a giant smothering fan, or even like a rope that has tied you up, preventing you from controlling your own life. But just as those blind men from Indostan, each of us, when trying to describe our grief, are partly in the right, but yet we are also in the wrong when we expect the grief of others to match up to our own. Ultimately, though, just like a giant elephant, our grief cannot be avoided. Take a look at this image. This image here. You are all, uh, you are all carrying around your, your grief in some form or way. It just looks different depending on your own unique situation. At first, grief is heavy, large, and uncomfortable, like a giant garbage bag. It doesn't even have a handle. Over time, your grief evolves into a large, a large heavy suitcase. But at least, you now have a handle. Finally, your grief evolves even more into a small, portable handbag. You can sling it over your shoulder or carry it in your hand, but you still 
have to carry it. Perhaps the final drawing should be a wallet, something so small and compact it can easily be placed in your pocket. Now each of us will have, will have to be the judge of our own grief, uh, of our grief currently, what our grief currently looks like, but carrying one's grief is not an option, it has to be done. The good news is with time and work, it does become more manageable. Finally, I would like to share with you one of my favorite poems on grief. I share it so often that some of you will recognize the, these lines. If you look on the back of your program, it reads, Grief Is by Courtney Fitzgerald. Grief is feeling happy one moment and then absolutely sad the next. Grief is moving forward while loving the past. Grief is full of unanswered questions and mysteries. Grief is trying to silence the memories of the past while also being comforted by them. Grief is waking up tired but full of sleepless nights. Grief is smiling when you want to cry. Grief is feeling frustrated by the non-grieving. Grief is a deserted island. Grief is learning to forgive the unintentional and thoughtless comments. Grief is frustrations with electronics that no longer work. Grief is endless. Grief is learning how to do things you never wanted to know how to do. Grief is picking up the pieces and understanding it will never be unbroken again. Grief is trying to heal broken hearts, although the person who's gone loved you deeply. Grief is learning not to compare. Grief is hard when the love was true, real, and strong. Grief is not having the right words to describe how terrible it actually is. After the musical number, uh, the names of the deceased will be read by the staff and volunteers of Southwest Medical Associates Hospice and Palliative Care. As we read the names of your loved ones who passed away, uh, who passed away during the previous year, we invite you to light your candle and reflect on the life and legacy they left for you, you, your loved one, and the world.
Isaac Abbott, Susan Adams, Ray Halona, Santiago Alonzo, Carol Anderson, Thomas Andretta, Marie Andrews Marantz, Armand Arendelle, Nicholas Arrigo, Donna Arendelle, Brent Autry, Susan Babis, David Babbage, Max Baker, Stanley Barnes, Dolores Bennett, David Barrett, Narsedalia Barron, Frank Beardsley III, and Gary Bulitsa. Kenneth Bell, Richard Blib, Joyce Benginger, Roy Benton, Elizabeth Beckenter, Joan Blaha, Mary Lucille Bolton, Conrad Boots, Gertrude Benham, Guadalupe Berner, Amber Briggs, Chris Bristol, Annette Brown, Carol Jean Brown, Philip Brown, Lavoy Botney, James Bruno, George Bubner, Rosio Baktuklan, and John Cottlewood. Lester Campbell, Alberto Carluto, Timothy Carpenter, Bobby Carson, Wallene Carter, Erasmo Castillo, Shirley Kastner, Jer Joseph Cervelloni, Keith Chamberlain, Wayne Chambers, Jack Chancellor, Raymond Chaput, David Chedzoy, William Cherry, Vita Chu, Doris Clark, Merle Clo, Lloyd Coffing, Garner Cole, and Frederick Colesby. Lucille Comella, Ramon Concepcion, Barbara Cook, Wallace Cook, James Cooper, Lavana Corley, Peggy Couch, Ernestine Covert, Barbara Cox, Lorna Caza, Don Kramer, Lawrence Crawford, Dominique Surali, Mary Kiernan, Lillian Francis Curie, Marilyn Cutler, Jeffrey D'Ambrosia, John Daniel, Marilyn Davis, Marquetta Davis, Antonio D'Antonio, Brenda De Leon, Catherine Delgado, Catherine Dimitro, Doris Destito, Dante DiCenzo, Deborah Dickerson, John Dillon, Robert Dowdery, Carol Dreyer, Valerie Dunn, Janine Earl, 
Ricardo Ellis, Alan Angler, Linda Enos, Raymond Espinoza, Gloria Evans, Rita Evans, Dorothy Ewell Carter, Ben Falk. Patsy Farmer, Martha Figueroa, Pearl Forbes, Ronald Foster, Alberto Fuentes, Dale Fukuzawa, Gwendolyn Gebhardt, Carmela Gentile, Arthur Gilbert, Ruth Golden, Antonio Gonzalez, Carrie Goodwin, Demetrios Gorgolas, Maria Gavernal, Brian Grasmick, Russell Grabiel, Ellsworth Greco, Michael Groden, Esther Gross, Belint Glaris, Kachek Gia, excuse me, Gilasarian, Joan Hales, Nellie Hansen, Betty Harris, Billy Harris, Jesse Harris, William Harris, Lewis Harrison, Reiko Hayama, Margaret Henry, Vicki Herman, Delia Hernandez, Rocio Hernandez Rios, Norma Hesterman, Harry Heil, Connie Hickman, Beverly Hill, Henrik Holm, Elaine Horlick, Donald Howe. Tiger Nick Hugh, John Ayala, Sharon Jackson, Rachel Jaramillo, Stephen Chu, Michael Johnson, William Johnson, Margaret Jones, Linda Khalil, Terry Kayara, Howard Katzman, Chun Kim, UI Kim, Young Kim, Marjorie Kindle, Margaret Kirby, Thomas Klein, Wendy Klitzoff, William Knapp, Jason, Jason Kovic. Shirley Kowalski, Rose Krause, Rebecca Cooch, Donald Leas, Nina LaRosa, June LaRue, Judith Lavalli, Carol Levitt, Rita LeClaire, David Ledford, Otto Leva, Thomas Linehan, Carlota Lavario, Joyce Lewis, Karen Lopez, Bertie Lucher, Patrick Lynn, Robert Lynn, Domingo Medueno, Tracy Manning. Frank Mardell. Linda Mar Marlborough. Kyleen Martin. Deborah Masters. Agnes Matheson. 
Joan Matz, Michael Mayer, Michael McAllister, Mary McGinley, Eleanor McKay, Harold Miller, Jane Miller, William Miller, Lydia Mills, Patrick Menchie, Sigrid Mitchell, Wilma Munger, Ho Moon, Irma Jean Moore, Peter Moria. Helen Moreno, Romaine Moyer, John Moyle, Russell Mulholland, Rudy Mungare, Colleen Murphy, Rachel Musquiz, Dorothy Myers, Jane Myers, Karen Myers, Edward Nelson, Jack Nesbitt, Bernard Nowakowski, Francis O'Neill, Dora Ordaz Martinez, Juanita Ornelas, Elizabeth Orr, James Orr Sr., Louis Orton, and Edwin Perito. Jeffrey Parisi, Billy Payne, Rita Pelletier, Wanda Pence, Robert Perkins, Norma Peterson, Nina Pettinger, Arlen Petty, Margaret Petty, Alicia Pineda, Lavon Pleza, William Poglin, Stanley Pomerantz, Glenn Ponsler, Lucille Poole, Amanda Pope, William Poval, Karen Puckett, Imogene Purcell, Shelley Queen. Felix Cuero, Sharon Raymond, Charlene Railsback, Alphonse Brasgatis, Flora Rector, Michael Reese, Vanessa Revuelto, Sybil Reynolds, Alan Richardson, Valerie Richardson, Jimmy Rivera, Ida Rodriguez, Larry Roder, Joseph Roman, Marie Rosas, Lyman Rust, Richard Sable, Edna Samuel, Rosemary Sanna, Carol Sari, Felice Sabea, Nancy Schaefer, George Seifert, Dolores Grignol, Patricia Shahan, Gary Sheets, Leon Shortledge, James Slocum, Scott Sisko, Joel Slovis, Charles Smith, Virginia Smith. Joyce Smith, John Soderland, Angel Summers, Maria Soto, Virginia Spinell, Annabelle Stanford, Linda Stouffer, Virginia Stein.
Dolores Steffens, Martha Steiner, Dorothy Sterrett, Myrtle Stevens, Otto Stoker, Laura Strong, John Sweeney, Mary Tan, Joseph Titaro, Alpha Taylor, William Taylor, James Tesson, Bruce Thompson, Harry Thorne, Casey Tibbs, Genevieve Tobin, Mary Trevino, Adrian Eunice, Janelle Utsman, Linda Val Lee. Grace Valley Schreiner, Laurel Vincent, Rafaela Walker, Bonnie Walters, Winifred Ward, Diana Warren, Gary Weaver, David Welch, Anna Wellman, Robert Wary, Heather Westcove, Jean Weston, Molly Wheeler, Betty Williams, Louise Williams, Regina Williams, Lenny Wilson, Robert Wilson, Dolores Wynn, Des Moines Wise, Barbara Witt, Lillian Wong, Sandra Workman, Larry Yamamoto, Jack Yenchek. Thank you again for joining us in this memorial service uh, to the lives that have been lost for the previous year. A few years ago, a woman in her early 50s uh, died on our care, leaving behind a husband, also in his early 50s, as well as two sons, one 28, the other 22. About six months after his wife's death, the 22-year-old son died suddenly of what is best described as grief-related health complications. Over the next couple of years, this man and I met every so often to talk about his grief. Almost two years after the losses, we had a visit and he explained he was doing better, but the improvement had been slow and subtle. He explained, in my backyard, I have a pile of firewood. Most days during the winter, I take two to three logs from the pile for my fireplace. Because I only take two to three logs a day for a long time, it looks like the pile does not even change. Then after months of taking two to three logs each time, I suddenly realize I'm almost out of firewood. That's a lot like my grief. It is getting better, but the change has been so slow and subtle that I don't even really notice it until I look back and see how far I have come. We really hope this event has been a small source of comfort and one tool in your bereavement process by giving you the opportunity to look back and see how far you have come since the loss of your loved one. If you need additional assistance in your journey through grief, Southwest Medical Associates Hospice and Palliative Care is ready to assist. Following the benediction, there is a luncheon available in the great room. As you exit the sanctuary, it's to your left across the courtyard. Please join us there for additional conversation. Thank you. Robert. As we prepare ourselves to leave today, again, another thank you to you for being here. As I said earlier, I would love to say that grief goes away and that we miraculously overcome it. 
as I'm coming up on the anniversary of my mother's death who was on hospice. I would share with you that there will be moments that get easier. There will be moments where the wind might be blowing right or a song may come on or something in nature happens and you find yourself just bawling. It happened to me as I was pulling into a Walmart and all I could think of is get yourself together before you become one of the Walmart pictures on Facebook. <laughs> but I share this with you as a bit of laughter, but as a way to recognize the pain and the grief around those that we love. But I also want to remind you that even in your grief, something beautiful still remains. You see, the tide recedes, but leaves behind bright seashells on the sand. The sun goes down, but gentle warmth still lingers on the land. The music stops, and yet it echoes on in sweet refrains. For every joy that passes, something beautiful remains. Those that we love, their beauty remains in us, and we have the privilege to continue on with their legacy. May you all go in peace. May you be blessed today. May you know that as Southwest Hospice, we will continue to hold you in our thoughts and our prayers as you continue to walk this journey. And we have not left you. We are still here with you if you need us. May you go in peace. Amen.